Hello, folks. Hope everything's going all right for you. Great to have you aboard today. Um, I'm going to do our regular thing and make sure that you can see and hear me all right before we get started and we'll kind of uh, get uh, things underway. Hope you're having a fantastic week so far. Of course, it's only, well, Tuesday morning at the time of this live stream, so it's not like we've you know, we're deep into the week, but I hope everything's going all right so far. Um, and I hope you had a great weekend. Hey, Mason is with us. Fantastic. And Jaime, great. And we've got Jason. Oh, my gosh, we've got everybody coming on. That's great. And uh, let me know if you can see and hear me all right. That way we we know that everything is coming through all right. Technology is a funky thing. The other day after our lecture... Um, on Tuesday, I went off and did another lecture, this one for uh, some corporate training. Hey, thank you, Jason. Looks like we're good. Thanks, Mason. I did some corporate training and my internet started going out during this corporate training session. And it's like, okay, of course, right? That's just the way it is. Just the way it is. Okay, well, phenomenal. Let's go ahead and get started. We actually have a... Um, I think it's an exciting, it's kind of a mind bender of a lecture. So, hey, Timothy, we're going to have to just kind of go with it. Great to have you. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're going to mess with some ideas here quite a bit today. So uh, I hope you're all ready to, to strap in. I want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I should have had a drink first. Um, I want to start with a little section from the reading right here. It says, the market system with its essential components of land, labor, and capital was born in agony. Um, an agony that began in the 13th century and did not run its course well into the 19th. Okay, as I say, this pretty much sums up the next few weeks. We could, we could take this little snippet from the reading and like put it above our heads for the next three or four weeks and come back to it over and over and over. And it's going to be applicable. We are going to talk about the agony in which this market system was born starting today. And yeah, we could very well feel a little bit of this agony as we try to, you know, wrap our minds around the concept. So just so you know, this was very, very, very difficult for people in the economy to kind of wrap its mind around here at the beginning. And so it's going to be equally kind of weird for us. So with all that preamble out of the way, you know, whenever I'm in a lecture room, I say, hey, do me a favor. Um, it's a beautiful day so far. It looks like it's going to be a great day, wonderful weather. But more importantly, looks like it's going to be sunny. So what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and Venmo me $1 for the sun. That's your fee for enjoying the sunlight today. And it may not surprise you to hear that I have yet to be sent a dollar. Nobody has ever sent me a dollar for the sunlight that I have provided. Now, that may not be surprising to you. What I'd like to do is I'm going to pull up our question slide. I want you to tell me why you do not feel obligated to send me one dollar for the sunlight that you're going to enjoy today. So why not? All right. So let's play with that.
Okay, fantastic. And oh, hey, by the way, I got to bring that bad boy up, right? Um, right away, we got, oh, no, no, wrong way, wrong way. Let's start over. Let's start over. <laughs> We got at least five awesome comments and we have five contributors. Aaron just came in as well, so we're now at six. So let's go through some of these comments, okay? Um, and they're all, of, of course, correct. And yet you'd be surprised. All right, so let's, let's play with this. Um, so Mason said, you don't own the rights to the sunlight that I receive. So what constitutes ownership of the sunlight? So at least you are acknowledging that I can, in fact, own the rights to sunlight. Now, a lot of people would say, what do you mean you can't own the sunlight? But if I owned the rights, then I could charge for it. Um, so then we had a uh, Timothy. I think most people would feel you don't provide anything. The sunlight would just happen anyway. That's right. Sunlight is just this kind of naturally naturally occurring phenomena. I'm not providing it. And so why am I paying you for something that I have always enjoyed and that you are not doing anything to provide? Very fair. Very fair. Um, Hayden says, who are you to charge me for sunlight? Exactly. Right? Where do I get off saying, hey, just walking up to you, pay me for sunlight, all right? Uh, Aaron, we receive the sunlight regardless of whether we pay you or not. That's right, okay? In our current situation, whether you paid me or not, you're going to get it. It's like public radio and YouTube channels. Whether you pay for them or not, you're going to get them, okay? It's like O'Hare in, um, in the Lorax cartoon movie, Still came out a little bit a while ago, selling air, right? Very good, very good. So what we've kind of got here is this consensus that sunlight is a naturally occurring thing. You don't really own it or provide it. I'm going to enjoy it anyway. So where do you get off saying that I need to pay you for sunlight, right? Okay, so very good. Um, bear with me. It's going to, this is going to make sense. So this is from the reading. Land, labor, and capital did not exist. Let's explore that, okay? We, we're really going to do a lot of the reading today because we want to analyze what it's saying. Um, oh, and by the way, we had another comment there um, from Timothy. The whole world um, until the 16th and 17th century could not envision a market system for the thoroughly sound reason that land, labor, and capital, the basic agents of production, which the market system allocates, did not yet exist. Okay, land, labor, and capital, the basic elements we need for a market system to work did not exist. Now, you're like, what do you mean it didn't exist? Yeah, bear with me. Land, labor, and capital in the sense of soil, human beings, and tools, of course, were coexistent with society itself. It's been around forever. But the idea of abstract land and abstract labor did not immediately suggest itself to the human mind any more than the idea of abstract energy or abstract matter. Land, labor, and capital as agents of productions, interper you know, impersonal, dehumanized economic entities are as much a modern conception as the calculus, meaning the calculator. Um, there is a huge abstract land, abstract labor, abstract capital is not the same as oil, as soil, human labor, and tools. Okay. And it's this abstract that is important to understand. So, and this is where it gets really mind bending. We're going to do another question one here. Trust me, this will make sense. Okay. A chair. What makes a chair a chair? 
when you point at something or whatever and say, that is a chair, what makes it a chair? Okay, I promise this will make sense. And we'll come over here. Okay, fantastic. We are, by the way, when it comes to awesome comments, we totally hit awesome comments. All right, so you know the drill. 8.42.10. 8.42.10. And then we have two new contributors now, so we're doing fantastic. Oh, and, and Joseph just came in, so we have three new contributors. So we're at nine on the contributors. Fantastic. Okay, let's play with this, all right? And I'm not trying to be pedantic when it comes to this thing of a chair. We're exploring the idea of what it means to be abstract. What does abstract mean? So, for example, you say uh, it's function, the ability to use it and sit on it. You know, it's kind of interesting that Aaron would say it's function. Um, there's actually something I'm going to show you in just a moment that says that it all comes down to the function. Has nothing to do with the form, has everything to do with the function. If you can sit in it, right? Now, four legs, Jaime said four legs, a uh, place to sit your back. And by the way, Timothy referenced back to Jaime's comment on a backrest. There's a contention of whether or not it needs a backrest. And yet, four legs. So a beanbag chair has no legs, right? And so, and what if it has, you know, four legs, but they're interconnected? So it's all one leg, right? Um, and um, let's see, Timothy, anywhere you can sit can be called a chair. And Mario said the same thing. If you sit, well, then the ground is a chair. You can sit on the ground. You can sit on somebody's lap. You can sit on your dog. You can sit on a horse. And a horse has four legs. So if you can sit on a horse that has four legs, is a horse a chair, right? Um, and then uh, we have, uh, depends on your uh, connotation of it, Vanessa. Vanessa is in the house. So we have 10 contributors. It takes you guys no time at all, right? Um, chair is an inanimate object. Okay, so a horse would not be an it would is animate, so therefore it would not be considered a chair. But what if it is a fake horse or a stuffed horse, right? I think that uh, everyone can uh, recognize that it is a chair that would be poor. Okay, okay, guys, Hayden's on to something. Everybody can recognize it. So function and everyone recognizes, okay? Um, is a hot dog a sandwich, right? Well, you know, exactly, right? It gets really weird, Mason. You're absolutely right. So now, just before you think this is getting ridiculous, I, carry, I kid you not, there are people who actually get grant money to explore these philosophical questions, right, of what is a chair. So, for example, and this is from a real research paper, what makes a chair a chair? And their conclusion, 
Objects are usually made for some purpose, hence the functionality often, functionality, Aaron, right? Is often the most obvious common you know, denominator for the use or object class. We have purpose and affordance detector and by hallucinating an actor interacting with the scene if we can envision somebody sitting in it it is by definition a chair a chair can exist in your mind it doesn't have to exist tangibly when i said chair i didn't show you one but you knew what it was it was in your head this is abstract okay and yes it gets weird it's and it seems kind of ridiculous to even consider but now when we start thinking about things like abstract land and abstract labor and capital, it's no longer ridiculous. We are now talking about the building blocks of a modern, you know, free market system. So let's start with land. What do we mean by land, abstract land? Take, for example, land. As late as the 14th or 15th century, there was no land, at least in the modern sense of freely saleable rent producing property there were lands of course manors and principalities but they were emphatically not real estate to be bought and sold okay the idea of selling land was just outside of the realm of even how do you sell land it's a naturally occurring thing that everybody you you can't stop me from walking on land. Gravity is pretty much going to take care of that, right? Well, now, let's take sunshine, for example, which I said, you know, used as an example earlier. Yes, you can absolutely buy and sell sunshine. Um, many times when you build a building, you need to pay for sunshine rights because you are blocking somebody else's sunshine or um, you are blocking their ability to monetize that sunshine by creating solar energy from it. So we do, in fact, now buy and sell sunshine rights. And if you think about it, you know, we buy and sell views from our home. One of the things that makes a home particularly valuable, especially one up on the hill, is the view. Well, if somebody blocks that view, that reduces the value of the home. Therefore, the view, which is really just a point of view of you standing somewhere, is something that is monetized, okay? Um, Aaron said, uh, you can't pick up and walk away with the location of a piece of land. Yeah, and yet it's, it's something saleable, weirdly, okay? All right, so this was new to them, all right? So if we continue on, this is what happened. The enclosures happened. Now, by the way, if you're curious, this is a movie with Kevin Costner and Robert Duvall called um, Open Range. And this movie is all about this idea of enclosures, all right? Let's do the reading, and then we'll come back to Open Land. And it's all about wool, this movie. I mean, this, this whole section here was about movie, right? Um, and by the way, Joseph agreeing there with Aaron, absolutely. Um, that gets a reference to past lectures. Wool has become a new profitable commodity, and wool demands grazing pastures for the wool producers. The pastures are made by enclosing common land. Okay, it's really important that we understand what enclosing common land means. Back before this idea of abstract land, land was land. Nobody owned it. It was common land. Everybody had ownership of it, right? And there are some places that still practice this day. In fact, if you go BLM, Bureau of Land Management, there are public lands. Utah has a bunch of public lands. Montana, I think, has the most public lands. Public lands basically says they belong to the public. You want to, you want to, you know, go camp on it. You want to go recreate on it. It's public lands. You can do whatever you want. Um, and so common lands were lands that people had just lived on for generations. 
They had lived on this land for generations. And nobody at ever, any point ever said, gee, I wonder if we have the land rights. There, were no, there was no such thing. So they would enclose the common land. They put a fence around it. The patchwork of crazy quilted small scattered holdings, unfenced, recognizable only by a tree here and a rock there dividing a man's land from another, and common lands in which all might graze their, their cattle or gather peat, are suddenly declared to be the property of the lord of the manor. Well, hold on. I've been using this land with all my neighbors for as long as we can remember. We're talking generations. My land kind of starts more or less where that tree is. His is more or less where that rock is. But it's not like it. we kind of just share. It's just strong fences make good neighbors. We don't have strong fences. We just have agreements. And now all of a sudden, this, this lord of the manor shows up and says, I own it all. And it's like, what? What do you mean you own it all, right? All of a sudden, it's considered private property. They didn't even have an understanding of that. Aaron says, in Germany, if you don't put an enclosure fence on your land, anyone can still legally be on it and use it within certain reasonable guidelines. Real world example, bam, yes. And that's where kind of the European ramblers and so forth are all about. Ramblers are hikers, right? Walkers and, you know, they're called ramblers in, in England and Great Britain. And ramblers can ramble anywhere. If there's no fence, they can go there. So, yeah, fences, right? Thank you, Aaron. Great example. So, all of a sudden, these people who have been farming this land for umpteen generations, these folks show up and say, I own it. Well, now, this creates a problem. But it was not merely the wholesale land grabbing that warrants attention. The tragedy is what happens to the peasant. Deprived of the right to use the common land, he could no longer maintain himself as a farmer. Since no factories were available, he could not, even if he had wanted to, metamorphize into a factory worker. Instead, he became the most miserable of all social classes, an agricultural proletariat. Where agriculture work was lagging, a beggar, sometimes even a robber, usually a pauper. So I want you to think about this. Imagine you own your own business. You've owned this family business for generations and generations. Your great, 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 great grandfather and mother started this business, and it's been handed down forever and ever and ever. And all of a sudden, somebody shows up and says, hey, that business, that's my business. Um, you have a choice. You can either continue working for me in that business, um, but I get 80% of the profits. Or, you know what, I'm not even sure I need you, so take off. You're like, you can't do that. I mean, there's only a bazillion legal reasons why you can't do that. But since this was such a new thing, there were no legal reasons why somebody couldn't do that. And so people were snatching up land. If you had power, if you had influence, if you had wealth, and if you had, you know, some thugs with sticks on your side, you could grab up anything you wanted. It's public land, common land, and they would just grab it. OK. Um. So that's what's going on with land. All right, so that means we have now got all these people out there who are out of work because they were once farmers, but now they're not farmers anymore because they don't have a farm. We also have a bunch of landowners who need people to work their land. Now, they could tell the people who were on the land before, hey, go ahead and work it and I'll let you live here. But, eh. but now we need a workforce. We have this need for a workforce. Now, here's the thing. I told you early on in our lecture series that this whole idea of slavery was going to come back and we were going to explore it. Back in the early days, there were really only two ways that work got done. One of them is called custom 
tradition, right? Work would be handed down from generation to generation. It would be in the family. So, for example, my last name, Schiffbauer, it means shipbuilder in Germany. So, Aaron, where you've hung out, I'm shipbuilder. Well, that's because my ancestors, going back to when we were giving each other's names, were shipbuilders. Have you ever wondered why there's so many smiths in the world? Well, because there was a huge need for smiths, coppersmiths, blacksmiths, metalsmiths, you name it. And anybody who did the mining and did the, the you know, fun, um, refining of the ore and the brass and so forth, smithies, right? So... And many of you. So, uh, you know, if you know anybody named uh, Tanner, well, that was somebody who worked with lands or or Cooper. Um, Cooper is somebody who worked with copper. So at the very beginning, mostly it was just families doing the work. And that was pretty much the way it got done. Um, hey, Ryan. Fantastic. Glad to have you along. OK, um, your name, Doppel means double in German. Oh, that's cool. I wonder where that came about. That's interesting. Um, okay, so um, that was one way work got done. The other way work got done was command, which is really just politically, po politically correct speak for slavery, force. We're talking subjugation, penalty under the whip, caste systems and so forth. So, for example, early on, you know, defenders of slavery argued that ending the practice would destroy the Southern economy. Of course, they were wrong on every level humanly imaginable, but that was the thinking early in the days of, of this abstract labor, right? The idea is if I'm not going to get you to do something because it's your last name, and if I can't get you to do something because I'm going to beat the crap out of you if you don't, if those two options are off the table, what option is left? Well, the market system pursuing one's own monetary advantage. Okay. Now, the idea that you know, following the market forces of supply and demand, one can strive to better his or her material circumstances by providing goods and services for a profit, for gain. That was crazy talk back in the day. Absolutely crazy talk. And those in power you know, the landowners, the, 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 the people who were the lords and dukes and duchesses and, and royalty, those who really held the power and so forth, they didn't trust the system, all right? Um, it's, as it says here from the reading, um, it was this paradoxical, subtle, and difficult solution to the problem of survival that called forth the economists. For unlike the simplicity of custom and command, simplicity of custom and command, which is you're a shift bower, you're going to build me a boat. You're a slave, you're going to work the land. Nice and simple. All right. It was not altogether obvious with e um, that with each man out only for his gain, society could in fact endure. It was by no means clear that all the jobs of society, the dirty ones as well as the plush ones, would be done if custom and command no longer ran the world. Okay, so what's he saying? He's saying, listen, 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 listen. There's a lot of crap jobs out there. There's a lot of crap jobs. And the way we get the crap jobs done is <clears throat> either your last name is crap and your family has always done these jobs and there's a caste system that says you always do them. And this is the way it still is even, even in some countries, which is if you're born into this caste system, you do the low crappy work. OK, or I'm going to force you. I'm going to find all these slaves and I'm going to subjugate you and so forth. And we're going to get it done. Well, now, if I can't do that anymore. 
who's going to do the crap work and why? Right? Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So what, who's going to do it and why? That was the real question. Okay. Oh, wrong button. Okay. Now, this is a real serious, serious question. And it's not, it's not one to be taken lightly. One thing that the reading says is that society's existence hangs by a hair. I really like this. I'm not going to, you know, I like this a lot. Let's do the reading, but then I'm going to tell you what this is about. Okay? So, a modern community is at the mercy of thousands of dangers. If its farmers should fail to plant enough crops, if its railroad men should take it in their heads to become bookkeepers, if bookkeepers should decide to become railroad men, if too few should offer their services as miners, peddlers of steel, candidates for engineering degrees, in a word, if any of a thousand intertwined tasks of society should fail to get done, Industrial life should soon become hopeless and disorganized. They're not kidding. This is a story. Now, it happened back in uh, 2015. And if you want to find it and listen to it, it is hugely fascinating. Um, in Lebanon, calls for protests as, as, um, as police push back demonstrators. This is Lebanon, the power, Paris of the Middle East, this beautiful jewel of a city. And the, and the government came down. Why? Because garbage collection ceased. Now, you'll have to listen to it to really appreciate it. But what it basically came down to is garbage collection stopped for whatever reason. The garbage collectors were on strike. They weren't doing their job and so forth. And the streets were just piled high with garbage. And this created protests, which means the police came out and shot protesters, which means more protests came out, which means more strong arm taxes, tactics and so forth. In other words, the Lebanese government fell because trash collectors did not do their job. Society hangs by a hair. All right. So these poor sods are kind of freaking out. Well, what is going to cause somebody to do the crap work if we can't force them to or if they weren't born into a caste, you know, a caste, a, a hierarchical caste that says you have to do it? The answer is the profit motive. We are going to hear about the profit motive over and over for the rest of the semester. There are five key aspects of capitalism that we are going to explore in depth. Daniel, exactly. Money. Money. Okay. Five key aspects of capitalism that we are going to explore in depth over and over. The first of these is the profit motive. Now, profit is, you know, right here, um, a, well, a continue, a moral concept that personal gain is good. The idea that each man uh, not only may, but should constantly strive to better his lot. Not only is profit good and you striving to better your material lot, in other words, you know, higher standard of living, but you should do it is the profit motive. Um, so, and continuously, continuously over a period of time, always, right? It never ceases. The profit motive never ceases. Um, and this is a really key aspect. You will never have enough money. Um, trust me, I can tell you this anecdotally, but I can also tell you it from the re tell you this from the research. There's a funny darn thing. We all we always tend to live just beyond our means. And we're always thinking, as soon as I can earn ten more thousand dollars ten thousand dollars more a year, I'll be better off. Well, eventually you'll earn ten thousand dollars more a year, but by then your me your your standard of living will be even higher. And you will always strive 
to improve your material lot, which means you'll never make enough money. You will always want more. Now, it may not necessarily be money. It could be more time, more flexibility, more autonomy, more security. There is at no point in the human condition where we say, I am done, I have arrived. Okay, that's just the nature of our existence. Joseph, totally, I agree with you. So the profit motive is a strong motivator for us to continually strive forward. And that is what is going to cause people to do the, the dirty work because people are going to pay you for it. All right. Later on, and you can do it right now, Google how much a trash collector makes in Salt Lake County. They make pretty good money because we have to pay them to do it. Um, yes, Ryan, you're right. Financial nirvana does not exist. It is so true. OK, now this brings up the emergence of the philosophy of personal gain. Now, remember last week um, when we spoke, we talked about how religion and personal gain really clashed. Religion did not trust the idea of personal gain. They eschewed it. Um, they thought it was sinful. They thought it put the soul in jeopardy. They were concerned about greed and avarice. Well, that's starting to shift now. The idea of personal gain was becoming in vogue. Now, there's a few reasons why it was becoming in vogue because of the reading. And then I'm going to add one more uh, just for grins and giggles. First, um, there was the gradual emergence of national units in political units in Europe. OK, why does this have anything to do with personal gain? Well, look at these headlines. Remember back when Amazon was competing to or cities were competing to have the next Amazon headquarters? Or right now we have the inland port going in here in Utah over by the airport. Um, cities, counties, states, and even countries fight really, really, really hard to bring in business because bringing in business brings in jobs, which brings in <clears throat> a tax base, which allows these governments to provide more services, higher standard of living, which in turn increases prosperity, which increases businesses coming in. And you see how the cycle goes. So we know today that a lot of cities and counties and so forth fight hard to bring business in. Well, at this stage, Europe was starting to kind of develop these political units, countries, provinces, and so forth. And they wanted power. They wanted wealth. They wanted influence. Remember, we've talked all about what is wealth, what is power, what is influence. And they wanted this. And they realized that the way to getting this is through wealth, through building profit, through bringing in business by making business easier. Another thing that's going on at this time is a second great current change was to be found in the slow decay of religious spirit under the impact of skeptical, inquiring, humanist views of the Italian Renaissance. All right, what does that mean? It means we've just gone through the Renaissance and people are skeptical now of, of religious dogma. Now, we, re, we discussed dogma and axioms in depth at the beginning of this lecture series. So you know that dogma is an idea it is set forth that is set forth by some authority as incontrovertibly true, not even up to be contested. I say it's true, therefore it's true, it's dogmatic. And so when religion says money is evil, the Renaissance skepticism says, how? How is money evil? Seems to me I can do a lot of good with money. Seems to me that I can build opportunity with money. Seems to me that I can feed a lot of people with a lot of money. Seems to me that I can, you know, raise a strong, healthy family with money. How is money evil? 
And the dogma says, ah, oh, you're questioning me. You can't question me. And yet at this time, it's like, I think I'm going to question you. I think I can do that. Timothy, kind of people um, like people are skept skeptical now of polit politicians and politics in present day United States. Absolutely. Right. Um, we're starting to say, you know, what's this about public servant? I'm not sure I've seen a public servant in quite some time. I'm seeing a lot of self-serving ideologues, but I haven't seen much in the way of public service. That's the skepticism, right? Very good. Then we have still another deep current lies in the slow social changes that in, um, inevitably make the market system possible. In this section, it's talking about mobility. Now, let me give you an example. Um, I'm willing to bet that there are people online with us right now who have grandparents who have always lived in Utah. They were born in Utah, lived in Utah, still live in Utah. Okay. Um, it may not necessarily be the case, but I'm willing to bet that you know somebody like that. Um, back in the day, even in the United States, it's very, very, very common for people to born, be born, live, work, and die all in one geographic region. Okay? Well, we start to break that. We start to say, you know what? I'm going to go where the opportunity is. And so many of your parents have moved all around the country and in some cases all around the world following opportunity. Now, that's a relatively modern invention. Like I said before, there are many people who were born, lived, worked, and died in just one area. And so you could always count on having them as a workforce, but not necessarily anymore. And then the last one, perhaps the most important of all the pervasiveness of this effect was a rise in scientific curiosity. The pre-capitalist era back in the old day saw the birth of the printing press, the paper mill, the, wind, uh, the windmill, the mechanical clock, the map, a host of other inventions. The idea of invention itself took hold. Experimentation and innovation were looked upon the first time with a friendly eye. It was no longer just do it the way you've always done it because it's always worked and it maintains the upper class and the upper class doesn't want anything to change. It's now we can try new stuff. We can try new things. We can find efficiencies. And all of this is bringing about serious, serious change. And agony, which continues, I maintain, to even today. Okay? All right. Now we're going to talk about abstract capital. All right? We've talked about, you know, abstract um, land and so forth. Let's talk for a moment about abstract capital. Um, capital, of course, existed. Tools, money, these things totally existed, right? Um, but although the funds existed, there was no impetus to put them to work aggressively. In other words, there was no real driver to invest. Why would you invest? Investment is risky. And in this day and age, it was all about keeping, right? Keeping it safe, right? Sticking it under mattresses. So all those dukes and dukedoms and all the upper class and so on and so forth, they were not so much interested in investing and growing as they were in maintaining their power. So risky business, the movie, right? Th that wasn't something that was really done. Instead of risk and change, the motto was safety first, okay? So the idea that you would actually invest money, that was, that was a really new idea. And as we're going to see on Thursday's lecture, that idea of investing money goes ballistic and everything changes as a result. Okay, 
Here's our closing quote for the day. Names are cages. Naming something limits its definition and pigeonholes its functions. I have no idea where this quote came from, but I like it because as we talked about with chair, as soon as you name something, you limit what can be a chair. And yet, as soon as you name something, you you stop thinking of other opportunities, right? Other options. And it's the same thing when it comes to land, labor, capital. As soon as they open their mind to the idea that it could be something more than just dirt that you stand on, you know, whole new horizons open up. Okay. So, bam, that's our lecture. I told you it was going to be a little weird, a little funky. Trust me, though, back in the day, this was extremely disruptive. This was really uncomfortable, and we're going to see this continue on for the next few weeks. Okay, so that wraps things up. As per usual, what I'll do is I'll stick around here in the comments in case you have any questions or anything. We've al You already know that the reading for on Thursday, do the whole reading. Trust me, it's really good. It's a really good reading. I maintain that the life you live today will become much clearer as you do that reading. So go ahead and do that reading and we'll come back Thursday and we'll get into some good stuff. All right. Fantastic job today, everyone. Um, and uh, as always, have a fantastic day. We'll see you.